today from Luke chapter 5. If you have a Bible with you, please will you turn to Luke 5 um, and uh, just hold your finger there or um, get a pen and a notebook out and make it available, keep it there. There's some really exciting stuff going on. Um, December is always a, a very big season for us as a church and as a church community. Um, it is disappointing that we can't be here, um, but we're on a long-term journey. Okay? So if you, if, you, if you can help take just a long-term view on our engagement here in this facility, it helps put shape to some of the challenges we're facing um, in the next uh, few weeks. And challenges purely just because we can't be in this room, but we're still going to be gathering. Um, just not in this room, we're going to be gathering at homes. Please make sure that you get to the info desk and um, uh, sign up for a church at home space where you can go to next week um, and the week after, um, and then also the two Sundays in um, December. Uh, just on a personal note, huge excitement um, for carols at the uh, Tolworth Rec. If you were with us in the Rose Theatre um, two, three years ago, um, we're going to try and not replicate that. We know we can't. We're not in the Rose Theatre, but we are taking the same line um, of approach to that. And obviously, we'll be advertising this quite widely in our community. Um, can I encourage you to, when the tickets or the reservations go open and become available, that you climb in on that as soon as you can. Otherwise, you will be disappointed. Um, we're expecting over 200 people in this room for that occasion. Um, so it is going to be an interesting season. Remember, Grow Baby um, is launching their Chris Christmas initiative um, at the beginning of December where we do over 3,000 gifts to children in our borough that don't have access to that. Um, you can learn more about that on the City Changer Project's website. Just look for Grow Baby Christmas. Um, and then on the 19th and the 20th of December, Christmas Lunch and Jesus also happens from this venue. So there's, um, there's a lot that you can engage in. Uh, we're looking to do 1,300, anything over 1,000 really, hampers. Those hampers will be going to uh, 1,000 families, plus 1,000 plus families. Um, and uh, obviously, we do that because we love. <laughs> we don't do that because we feel morally obliged. Yeah. Um, or because this is some other religious occasion that we just, you know, try and dampen our, our conscience for a moment. Um, but it's a moment where we as a church get to serve. It's a moment where we as a church get to engage because we love, because we have discovered something of God's love for our own lives. Um, and that's really where I want to dive in in today's word. You know, coming out of COVID, the COVID season, how many of you can remember that still? Um, <laughs> It's still there, okay? It feels a while back, doesn't it? Um, and you actually have to start digging through the files between then and there. Just as Matt was saying a few weeks ago, we had a movie night. It was just last Saturday, Matt. Um, <laughs> just, just to remind you, that was last Saturday. Um, uh, you know, life happens. And it happens at a very quick pace. Does it happen to you as well? Or is it just me? Am I on a different planet? Um, my um, Joan <laughs> feels he doesn't really know that. Give it a few years, my boy. <laughs> um, but you know what? When you come out of this, when you start measuring life around you, I think there's always two really good questions to ask yourself. Well, it's actually one question with two aspects to it. You know, is life just busy or is life significant? Because there's a different answer to that question, depending on which angle you look at it from. And the purpose of our lives so very often is not just to fill up our lives with activities and busyness. But how do we really perhaps even sometimes get rid of our business to make sure that we get to a place of significance where our lives really count? Um, on Friday I had lunch with a couple just chatting about stuff here, happening here in the Tolworth Rec. Um, and at one stage... The husband in this lunch turns to me and he says, you know what, I'm so tired of doing things that are soulless. Such a beautiful vocabulary, isn't it? Because we can so easily get caught up in these things that are busy, but there's no soul to it. There's no, there's no sense of life to it. There's no, it's not engaging who you are as a person. It's not enlightening that. 
And um, a number of months ago, we were in a staff meeting and we were reading a portion of scripture from Luke 5, which I'm going to take you to in a minute. And at one stage, Paul makes a comment about what happens in this. And he says, isn't this, wouldn't this be a great uh, sermon series if we ran a sermon series like that? And I sat there thinking, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to develop something around that because it was so appealing. It had so much soul to it, okay? And that this, what happens in Luke chapter 5 is very simple. On a day, says the Bible, that many Jewish leaders were gathered together in a specific place, religious leaders known as the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were people of very strict laws. They had a long list of laws that, they were gov gov um, that, that governed their lives. And they thought and considered that if they were keeping all of these laws, they would feel closer to God. They would have greater access to God. And these group, this group of people was gathered in a room together. And Jesus was there. And they'd heard from all over this area that he was coming into the area. So people streamed to this little house. And the Bible says the power of the Lord God surged through Jesus and he instantly started healing the sick. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It was just a surge. It was this moment of God's revelation. And, and healing started taking place in people's lives. And so as they're there, the Bible says, um, some men came to Jesus carrying a paraplegic man on a stretcher. And I have this picture in my mind of these four men at each corner of the stretcher. And they were trying to come in. But the Bible says... The house was so crowded, they couldn't push through to get to Jesus. And so they decided to make a plan. And they, they, they recognized they couldn't get like that. So they, they, they climbed up. I don't know how they got there. Maybe at the side of the house, had a pair of stairs. And they got, the Bible says they got to the top. They started taking the roof tiles off. And they dug their way through the roof tiles. And then lowered this man on the stretcher into the middle of this conversation. It's like, we're here and suddenly there's a stretcher coming down from the top of the roof. It must have been a fascinating moment. You imagine suddenly all the dust starting to move aside and you know trickling down and people started looking up and Jesus maybe, okay, coffee break guys, uh, let's do a coffee break. And, and then suddenly there's a stretcher in the middle of the room. And the Bible says this fascinating thing in verse 19 and 20. It says, seeing the demonstration of their faith. The demonstration of their faith. Faith became visible. Jesus says to this paraplegic man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Which is a very strange thing to say. And we're going to spend some time about in, in that a little later. But what happens in this moment is that there's, there's this moment where this young man is healed. And he stands up from the stretcher. And people are in confusion. Some One half of the room is in confusion. The, 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 the Pharisees, these religious leaders, had a lot of confusion. And other people were ecstatic, worshipping God. And this man walks out of the door. I can just see him trying to squeeze out. And people are like making a way. And here's this guy going and he's completely healed. A fascinating moment. And what I found even more fascinating is whilst there were other people that were also healed instantly, says the Bible, we just read that, this man's story gets noted. There was something about this man's story that was important enough for the writer, a guy called Luke, to write this down. Luke was a medical doctor and he wrote about Jesus' life and this is what he writes. See, there was something compelling that happened in this moment and there's a few compelling things. There was something compelling about these four friends' faith. There was something compelling in Jesus' comment to this man on the stretcher and then there was something compelling about how the audience and the people, they reacted. Now, if you think about the theme, rip the roof off, you can immediately see where this message is going. Okay. How do you and I get to rip the roof off? All right, maybe, maybe not physically, maybe not literally. But how do we get to demonstrate our faith in relation to the people that God has placed in our lives. Because maybe you might not have a friend that is a physical paraplegic person and you want to drag into this room on a stretcher or maybe rip the roof tiles off in order to bring that person to Jesus. But maybe there's a friend that you have that, that, that sits next to you at the desk at the work. Or maybe it's a person that lives in your street. Or maybe it's it's, it's, it's somebody that you're connected to. Maybe it's a family member or, or a son or maybe it's your mom. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you feel and you're going to leave this message here today thinking, this is the person I need to rip the roof off for. 
for me personally, it's one of the dads that stands next to me most Wednesday evenings when I'm watching Joe and play hockey. And I get completely emotional when I start thinking about that. And I'll tell you in a few minutes why. But you know what? When we're confronted, when, when you're confronted, just perhaps hearing this message rip the roof off for somebody, there, there might be three different reactions that you're having. The one might be awkward. You know, you might be thinking, oh gosh, what is Yanni saying? Must I now, you know, must I, must I go into, you know, must I pick up a megaphone and like, hey, have you ever heard about Jesus type of thing? And I, I, I read this. I was, I was flipping through Instagram, and there's this little video clip that come, come, came up onto my feed about a comedian, not a Christian comedian, a commercial, I mean, a secular comedian, and, and he's, he's doing the skit about how Christians share their faith. And he says, isn't there a more awkward point in a conversation when somebody in a, in a, in a social setting says, um, can I speak to you about Jesus? <laughs> And he's making a joke, and the audience goes, ha, 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 And I'm sitting there watching this video thinking, I know exactly how that feels. Sometimes it's awkward. Okay? Sometimes you feel inadequate. Do I know enough scripture to speak to this person? You know, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, where did, where did Adam and Eve's children get their wives from? I don't know, maybe, that, what if the person asks me stuff like that? Maybe the person asks me, was Jonah really in the belly of a real whale? Was that literally so? I don't know, what am I going to answer? I feel inadequate. Or maybe I just don't know how to pray. I don't, I don't know I, if this person says. So there might be a sense of inadequacy, but it also might be a sense of guilt. And let me help you remove that one immediately. Because we sit in messages like this on Sundays like this and you hear about ripping the roof off and you feel guilty because you're not one of the friends ripping the roof off the tiles to let some of your friends in. I just want to remove all of those things. But what I want to do with this message is I want to bring into view, I want to bring into context the fact that we might be missing small miracles around us happen every single day. And how do we become aware of those and how do we take those opportunities? Because in this moment, when these four friends let, the, let this stretcher come down, actually what happens is Jesus dismantles with his comment. When he starts speaking to this young man, um, and, and, and here's the stretcher right here, and, and, and the stretcher goes down and it lands right here, Jesus actually dismantles the economy that was driving the whole conversation in the room. And I, and I want to I wanna actually show you exactly what happened yeah. um, right there. Because it, he, Jesus addresses this young man. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. What was the economy of the room? Come on. It's fine. You can speak out loud. It's loud here in this church. Okay? We're not in a church. We're in a gym. So you can speak out. <laughs> <laughs> what was the economy? Sin. Am I doing things right? Have I done things wrong? That was the economy of this moment. And you know what I find fascinating? Is that if you just read a few verses before then, in Luke chapter 5, right at the beginning of this chapter, you read a fascinating portion of Scripture. You read how Jesus calls one of his first disciples, a guy by the name of Simon Peter. Okay. And Simon Peter's there on the beach. He was a fisherman doing his daily job. And the next minute, Jesus comes there, and there's so many people that Jesus has to get on one of the boats. And I can see somebody saying, you know, Peter, would you give your boat? And Peter's, and he rows out, and here's Jesus standing, and he's talking to the crowd, and, and, and Peter's hearing amazing things. And the next minute, they row back to the beach. And as they get back to the beach, Jesus says to Peter, why don't you row in again and just throw your nets in on the other side? And Peter's like, Hang on, you're not even a fisherman. I mean, do you know that we've been fishing the whole night? How many of you felt that you've done that before? Come on. You've been fishing the whole night and nothing happened. All right. And they say to Jesus, but on your word, we'll do this. And so Simon Peter rose out into the, into the, uh, away from the beach and he throws the nets in on the other side. And the next minute, there's this massive miracle. That, that whole, there's so much fish that they have to, all the other boats eventually come and help them to drag all of these fish out. Something happened in the economy 
of the village because Jesus showed up into the situation. And on the beach, when Peter gets out of the, be- uh, out of the boat and he sees Jesus, he falls down on his knees. And this is, these are the words that come out of Peter's mouth. He says, forgive me, go away from me, master, because I am a sinful man. It's the economy. It was what was driving the whole understanding of what God was doing in their midst was sin consciousness. They were aware of what they'd done wrong and what they were doing right and how would, if they were doing wrong, God would be angry with them and if they were doing right, maybe God would smile on them. That was the economy of the moment. You know, on Wednesday night, on Wednesday night, I'm stood there. How many of you can remember how it rained on Wednesday night? Okay. So just to say, Cherish, you, you girls dragged my wife away in the car. And so my wife's with a car at the hub doing her little girly thing. Okay? Not a little girly thing, but she's blessing all the women. And I'm standing with my bicycle next to the hockey field and an umbrella. Okay. <laughs> In this pouring rain, because there's nowhere to go next to the hockey field, there's no clubhouse there, and I'm watching Joan play, and as I'm standing there, this dad comes along. He could have stayed in his car, and he walks along, and I'm thinking to myself, why is he walking over here in this rain? And for an hour, we stood there under the umbrella, and I'm listening to the economy of this man's life. I'm listening to his story. And I'm thinking, Jesus has something to say about your story. And whilst this is your story today, I want to trust God with you that it's not your story any longer tomorrow. It's an economy that drives people's lives. It could be the economy of fear, right? Fear of the economy. It could be an economy of rejection, relationships that have fallen apart. It could be an economy of you have to accomplish well in order to feel worth. What is the economy of that moment? And the economy of this moment was a moment where where sin consciousness was driving this. Come on, are you with me, church? And, and, and they, they measured everything as to what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. And when Jesus sees this young man come down and he sees this demonstration of the faith of these four friends, he doesn't say to the young man, get up off your bed and be healed. He says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus introduces a new economy. <laughs> he introduces the economy of value. And inheritance, come on. He says, to this, he says to this young man, son, okay, he wasn't his physical father, but the concept of son introduces us to this environment of the fact that we belong to a family. God is our father and we are his children. Come on. And he invites him into the space. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. You have an inheritance in this family. Can I tell you, not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. There's still economy that drives people's lives. We just need to find out exactly what that economy is. A few months ago, Shireen and I had the privilege of, of, of attending a barbecue at a, a friend's house, somebody who's not in our church. And, and so we stood there at this barbecue, and the kids are playing around, and, and, and one, of the, one of the people at the barbecue, this guy who I don't know, I've never met this guy, this elderly man walks over to me, hey Greg, you can see he's moving a little slowly, and he walks over to me and we start talking, and obviously his grandkids, it's the, his grandkids' birthday party here, and we're enjoying this moment, and we start sharing with each other, and, and then, then he asks me the dreaded question, okay, you know what the dreaded question is if you're in my profession, all right, all right, what's the question? What do you do for a living, yeah, okay. Because I know immediately this conversation is going to go in one of two directions. Ask me, what do you do for a living? Oh, I lead a church. And he starts telling me his story. I didn't expect that. Normally it's, they walk away. Oh, let's get another drink, please. <laughs> he starts telling me his story. He says, oh, I used to go to church. 
I actually loved going to church. So I went there with my dad. My dad had trouble and then he committed suicide. And I was 16 years old. My mom wasn't around. And I started looking for a church that would bury my father. The church wouldn't bury my dad because he'd committed suicide. And I walked away from God when I was 16 years old. And he starts sharing his life with me. How do you restore? Only God restores 60, 70 years worth of loss. But here's an economy. Here's an economy driving this moment, driving this person. This is what he works with when he thinks about God. How can I demonstrate faith so that the words of Jesus can be heard in this moment? You see, we have to recognize that, that this message comes with two elements. The first one, we have to understand that there's a difference between compulsion or compulsory motivation. Let me say it rather like that. There's a difference between us just walking out here feeling motivated. We're not going to go and share. It's a difference between just being motivated and having compassion. Okay? What I'm not trying to bring into our discussion and our conversation today is just purely motivation and inspiration. I want to ignite a sense of compassion in your heart. Here's the second element that this message works with. It always becomes attractive when we demonstrate it. (laughs) When Jesus looked at these four young men's faith, he found it so attractive, so incredible that he responded, Son, your sins are forgiven. Incredible. You see... Something happens in your life and that becomes the story. You know, the question is, what do you have in your life that has happened that can become so attractive, so beautiful, so, 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 so compelling that you could tell that story to the people around you and they would discover something? You see, here's my observation when I read Luke chapter, eight, uh, Luke chapter 5. People wanted more than just Jesus' opinion about things. They wanted more than just a new religion or a new philosophy or a new lecture about theology or stuff. They they, they weren't there to receive that. They'd come to see something that had power and authenticity and authority rooted in the middle of it. That's what they discovered. You know, the, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we have in our hands? We have, this morning as we sang that lyric, the resurrection has won. The resurrection has repositioned us. You know, there's something happened because Jesus was raised from the dead. You and I carry that reality yeah. in us. We've got skills. You know, maybe, maybe you can help people with whatever they need. No strings attached. Just do what you can. You, you've, got, you've got a story that you can tell. You've got resources, stuff, okay? <laughs> you, you, you can meet some needs. Maybe you can babysit for a single mom or you can do something. This, you can contribute something of value that this person needs. All that this paraplegic man needed was four friends with some initiative and a bit of muscle. So they didn't have to conjure up anything. They didn't, you just needed to carry that stretcher with great struggle to the top of the roof, dig through a roof, okay? <laughs> it's all. In Romans chapter 10, we read this incredible portion of Scripture. This, this portion of Scripture is just, it is like ringing in my ears over the last number of months. Can I read it to you from verse 12 to 15? It says, faith eliminates the distinction between Jew and non-Jew. Actually, what he's saying is, is faith eliminates any form of distinction. Stop thinking about who's in and who's out and you know, who's this and who's that. and what. Just remove it because faith removes all of those boundaries. Removes any distinction. He's the same Lord for all people. 
Okay, here I'm stood under the umbrella on Wednesday night, and this friend of mine standing next to me in the rain. Faith removes any sense of barrier in this moment. It's the same Lord, same Lord over my life, same Lord over this family's life. He has enough treasures to lavish generously on all who call upon him. <laughs> Some of you have forgotten that, by the way. I'm just reminding you. And it's true. Everyone who calls on the name, Lord's name will experience new life. How many of you in the room can say yes? That is true. Come on, hands up. Yeah. It's true. Now he says, but how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? That's pretty obvious. And how can they believe in one whom they've not yet heard of? Okay? Most people in our nation have heard of Jesus. They've heard of him. And how can they hear the message of life if there is no one to proclaim it? That's the point. And how can the message be proclaimed if messengers have yet to be sent? If you're thinking, praise God for Yanni and Matt and Paul. God has sent them. I'll just make sure life works out for me. Shame on you. <laughs> And just make sure for all the South Africans in the room, it's not that type of shame. Okay. <laughs> yeah, how can the message be heard? If no one feels they're sent. If no one recognizes they're sent. Says, That's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of those proclaiming the joyful news of peace and of good things to come. You know, this is recorded actually in the Old Testament, this portion of scripture here. It comes out of Isaiah and actually tells the, the, the story that the watchmen were on the tower and they would watch, they would check and they would see the messenger come with the good news, the battle had been won and they would declare it, this exciting news of victory. They would, they would declare it leaping with faith and joy. They'd not seen the battle won, but they knew the messenger had brought the message discovered something. And as I, as, as, I, as, I, as, I stood, I stood, as I stood in the rain on Wednesday next to that hockey field, and that's a journey, okay, bear with. It was something that, that just drove this incentive in my heart. I recognized that for this guy and for this family, it's not do I have the courage and the compassion to share our lives with this family? That's not, that's, not, that's not what hinges on this moment. What hinges on this moment is eternity. Not for me and my opportunities, but for this family and his generations. That's what hinges. And if we can just... <laughs> How can you make someone's life? You know, like, you've made my day. You know that little thing that we sometimes, you've made my day. Oh, what a beautiful gift, you've made my day. Thank you. Well, you've made my year with this great, wonderful news. How about you make someone's life by ripping the roof off? Let's pray together. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, it's a simple prayer I want to pray in this moment. I want to pray, would you help us declutter a little? Just help us recenter again for a moment, just to see that which is important and that which is eternal and that which is of eternal value. 
And Lord, as, as, I, as I know, Holy Spirit, as I spoke, you, you brought people's names, faces in front of people in this room. I pray today, Holy Spirit, may faith arise. May, may you help arise. May, Holy Spirit, will you help us find a new level of faith in our own hearts that we might demonstrate our faith. May we demonstrate our faith. May we demonstrate our faith with a, with a sense of boldness and courage. Um, knowing, Holy Spirit, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do this out of just moral obligation. We do this because of compassion. We do this because we find ourselves sent. You have anointed our lives, each and every one of us, with your Holy Spirit so that we can know and understand that we are sent. We are sent, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We don't just find ourselves in, in situations. We don't just find ourselves under the umbrella in the middle of the rain. We, we are sent into these moments, Lord. I pray that there be many, 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 many stories like that in this room that will come from this room because people will say, I, 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 cannot, I cannot hold for myself what Jesus has done for me. This is something that spills over. There's a faith that needs to be demonstrated. There's a calling that needs to be answered. There's an eternity that needs to be honored. And I pray this in Jesus' name over us as a church and over us as a community. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this joy and this privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.